So I want to talk about some fruit that should cause immediate concern for those who are wanting to move forward in what God has for them. And many that I work with seem to have a real lack of um, solid awareness of what it is that God requires of his people. And there's just, a, there just isn't a lot of um, teaching available to them that makes them have a structure that they know this is what this is the path that I should walk in and what I'm going to give I, I've like done a lot of lists along the years because I I like really tangible and applicable type um, things I love that Jesus taught in parables because I I see pictures and so I tend to do the same because a lot of the people that are like me see and learn the same way but a lot of what I'm going to talk about is actually fruit. Fruit isn't the real issue, it's what grows from the root. So therefore the root is the problem and that's what needs to be addressed. And um, multiple times I have um, known that my life was for prayer ministry for the specific reason of tearing down strongholds, not helping people tear down strongholds, um, no one ever taught me about that in the beginning, so I went for a long time just battling these emotional things that I was just like, you wake up with just battling this impending doom and this paranoia and everyone hates me, they're all staring at me, they're all talking about me, just every day you walk in that and you're just um, paralyzed by all these things and I didn't realize it could get better and then someone talked to me about strongholds and the need to tear them down and actually help me with that process. And it was so impactful that I now do that as a, as a ministry. That has been, I will give up anything to get back to what God wants me to do, and that is help people tear down the structures that the enemy has built in their life that keeps them trapped in negative thoughts and emotions. So anyway, that's what um, I'm gonna be talking about is actually the fruits which the fruits are just what shows up in us where the roots are what need to be addressed. So that's a whole different process. And um, anyone who wants um, to talk more about that or, or have, uh, have prayer about that, I'm more than happy to help. So, but um, I used to, most people know, um, in my history, I, there was about 10 years where I visited correctional facilities as my role, my ministry role, and I was in about 30 a month. And I was sharing Jesus and hope with um, people in pretty desperate situations because um, for the most part, the people who end up in a long-term, a longer-term situation in jail where they actually can come out and see people coming in to share, they're in there for something fairly serious. Um, the minor, things are, are released fairly quickly. But I will never forget meeting this young woman in a jail up north. She came to talk to me. She was very urgent to talk to me. And so we were at a table and she's sitting here and I'm sitting here. We're about three feet away from each other. And most of us who have had encounters with methamphetamine know what someone looks like when they're addicted to methamphetamine but it's it's a little different now but years several years ago it was a it was a pretty bad situation and so she had that appearance so I knew immediately when she came to see me I knew she was addicted to methamphetamine so she had sores all over her face she had sores all over her arm and she um, they they you know there's just different ways of communicating that you can tell immediately that they're very fractured by that addiction. But what was different about this young woman is her, her appeal to me and her need to see me was, they took my kids, I need my kids back, I cannot live without my kids, I will commit suicide if I don't get my kids back. But the whole time she's talking to me, she's sitting there scratching her arm scratching these sores on her arm, just scratching and scratching, and then she'd go 
and she was trying to inhale what was coming out of her sores. And I was like overwhelmed watching this young woman because I realized that she had no idea. She had no idea what she, how, how serious her, she was trying to inhale the drugs that were coming up out of her body. So her thought is, it's coming out. I'm going to try to, uh, it's, it's troubling. I did see that on other people too. And it was, it left such an impact on me that um, I, many things have left an impact on me that I've just made it, uh, it's added to the passion that I have to get out here and try to help rescue some and bring hope to some and help some and I don't know what happened to this young woman, but I'll never forget her. And I just knew that I was probably unable to reach her at that point due to her preoccupation with her addiction. She just was more, she was so absorbed in that addiction that um, I can see the, why they took her kids away, basically. That level of disconnect, however, I see in people all around me frequently. I see that level of disconnect, not in such a terrible, initially um, re repulsive way, but in, in just as disconnected. The fruit that comes out of the mouths of us, I'm just gonna say us, including myself, in private and public settings and out from our behavior is evidence of who we really are and what our <coughs> true priorities are. And people may recoil in surprise at what comes out of us at times, but God sees and hears all, and he knows who we are. And he knows that this disturbing picture of this young woman is no different than many of us who profess Christ, but what comes out of us is so repulsive that it's just so repulsive. What we are full of comes back out of us, much like this drug was coming back out of this young woman in more ways than her speech and her behavior, and then she is trying to absorb it again. And most of us can admit that our drug and alcohol use was by far not our greatest struggle. A lot of times we see, even in this setting, any setting where there's recovery, that when you remove the drugs and the alcohol, you'll see binge eating, power lifting, people just pursuing relationships like crazy, they don't even care with who, but you'll see that pursuit go a different direction, full speed. So we know that the drugs and the alcohol were actually a band-aid for this terrible pain that we immediately grab another band-aid. Our struggle is what runs through our hearts and our minds and our anger, our shame, our critical spirits, our pride, lust, rebellion, impatience, and our inability to respect others are just a few of our true issues. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And much like this young woman who is scratching herself and how that affected me, so is our effect on others when we open our mouths and expose our sinful hearts to them and others, ourselves, just everybody around us. Matthew 15, 11 says, not what goes into the mouth defiles the man, but what comes out of the mouth, this is what defiles the man. In addition, we have this nonverbal body language that has the same effect as our mouth. We see people that stomp around in their behavior, silent treatment, nagging, where God sees no difference between these two at all. And I wanna help expose a few areas that you need to deal with quickly in order for a lot of people want what God has for them. They want the blessing and the favor of God. They want to actually be known as someone who honors and walks with God, but these are some deal breakers. And I have worked on this for years, trying to come up with as much of this in a comprehensive way as I can. Um, if you choose not to deal with these, all of these issues are major in action and you're going to be pretty useless to God. He will actually move past you to choose someone else to fill your coveted shoes and calling. And 
I've mentioned this before in a previous message, but Billy Graham once said that God told him he, had, he was the third choice to be Billy Graham, that the first two um, didn't step up. They weren't willing to lay down something and God moved to Billy Graham to be Billy Graham. But I don't want that for my life. I don't want God to have to pass over me because I've got some kind of character issue that I won't let go of or that I won't resolve. So if you want God's favor and blessing and his perfect will to happen in your life, these are areas you're going to want to pay attention to because other believers have listed these areas as what destroyed their destiny. Something in this list is what destroyed their destiny. So I've asked around and sought out similar messages for quite a while to come up with a list that I often speak of filters because these are beliefs, core beliefs we call them in treatment. Um, things that you believe about yourself, let's say your parents always called you stupid or rejected you and then you just walk with that thinking everybody's going to do that because it's such an ingrained belief in you that I'm unacceptable, no one listens to me, no one cares about me, um, I'm not seen, I'm not heard. Um, if those remain, it, it shows up all over in everything you do and you're pretty much benched. So filters are very important, whether they're good or bad. And so these are filters that hopefully you'll realize if you have these filters because they're bad fruit, and then you will do something immediately to cor correct not the fruit, but the root. Because if you modify behavior to correct fruit, you're leaving a root that's bad. That's still gonna keep growing bad fruit. So get to the root. A person, um, who can get that right will go back. You can Google strongholds and you can see a massive list of things that come up and that's what you need to start to address. And each one of these traits will be worth its own message, but um, this is gonna be a pretty comprehensive list. Um, many godly people fail to, um, they just fail to deal with this because a lot of these are cherished. They're just cherished behaviors and sometimes very enjoyable. And they just lose vision and blessing. And I just wanna help. I always want people to hold me to a high standard. I've, I've always kept people in my life that, that do that because I will, I tell people I don't backslide over a year, I backslide in five minutes. So. I want people to keep the standard and the bar high for me. And I know a lot of people resent me for trying to do that for them. And, and I'm, I, I wish that weren't the case, but I do want to keep a high bar for people so that they know where the standard is. So here are some things that you want to rid yourself of. I'm just going to keep moving down the list. If you want to walk in holiness, and to please God and be favored, these things have got to go. The first one is pride, which is self-obsession. And um, Shelly, I can um, send this to you, all the oh. notes. So I'll just, I'll okay. just send you the whole thing. Yeah. This comes in many, many forms. And what people don't realize is that low self-esteem is pride. So it's still a self-obsession. And many people don't know that when you walk around battering and abusing your own self with addictions, that's incredibly prideful because you don't have a right to yourself if you belong to Jesus. So low self-esteem is pride and sometimes a very serious form of it. If you do a word study on pride in the Bible, it would be helpful to just write out every verse that addresses pride because the word going into you is gonna help you re um, change that filter and realize how serious this is. This vice is the doorkeeper, it's the gatekeeper, and it lets in a host of other things, but it is generally the gatekeeper. And the Bible says, don't allow it to remain and root in your life. And daily, I repent of pride because it shows up all over the place. I remember in the, the quest of a vision by Rick Joyner, I remember the impact it made on me reading that and saying that the people who had pride were, were like crawling up this hill and they had all these arrows in their back. And their backs were just all shot up with arrows, but it was pride and they didn't even see them. They didn't even know that they were hit with these and they were barely moving 
but the impact of the pride on them, they, they, they didn't even see it because they, they just weren't even aware of it. But I just, pride is just a, a frequent flyer in everyone's life and should always be repented of constantly. And it's a tremendous threat to anyone who is walking with Jesus. And it lurks just waiting for us to lose our attention to it. It just lurks and waits. So when it comes in, we don't even really know half the time that it, and it stinks up the house so fast. So if a person's life doesn't radiate their love for Jesus, their commitment to him, their obedience to his word, loving and serving others as their top priority, pride is definitely in the house. Another is conformity to the world. This robs us of power and authority. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And it's a sad day for Christians when we look for ways to get close to the devil's fence, as close as we can get, to imitate his music, his clothes, other activities, saying that we're going to draw people to Jesus Christ. And this has to break the heart of God. We don't rely on the Holy Spirit and his power, which is incredible. We don't seem to even know the power of God to transform. We choose instead to go to the side of hell to borrow inspiration. And what God has isn't good enough, fun enough. Holiness and purity doesn't draw people, so we use sensational forms to draw them to what exactly? What you catch them with, you have to keep them with. And this is a total disaster for the church. And this produces totally carnal-minded Christians that keep using compromise to spread their form of Christianity that still serves self. And this is not saved, this is deceived. So rid yourself of all close friendships that are immoral and those that cause you to compromise walking in holiness. You don't have to rid yourself of all friends, but don't have your close friendships be people that walk in compromise. I've done that and I've paid the price. Holiness is an obvious quality that God requires of his people. And if you're a genuine Christian, you will strive for holiness. Next, Doubt, unbelief, fear, worry, and discouragement. Again, these are fruits. And this has been a very big battle for me. And this mindset cannot dwell where faith is. Faith and any of these things are not consistent and they cannot rule together. This is choosing to believe what the devil says is true instead of what God says is true. So basically the devil's talking to you and you're agreeing with him versus God's talking to you and you're saying, I don't believe you. God will not inhabit where these things are allowed to root. And thousands of Christians are locked in this bondage. They're totally powerless for the kingdom. They're missionaries actually for the enemy because they are gloomy, long faces. They walk around just steeped in darkness and everyone is like, why would you want to be a Christian? Look at them. Why would you want to be a Christian? I've said that plenty before I was even saved. I'd be like, why would anyone want that? I get it. I don't want to be one of those people. And again, each word is worth a study of its own. And there's many references to each one. My solution that has really worked for me, because I'm a very practical person, is um, unlike when I first became a Christian, now you can get what's called a Wonder Bible. You can order them. Um, it, Amazon, eBay, I mean, you can get them, um, but they are an audio Bible that you can plug into the wall and just leave lay anywhere. We have them in our houses. I have three of them in my personal house, downstairs, upstairs, two of them. One plays all night right by my bed. I have the word playing around me all the time. There's one in the garage. Tatiana made us one for the garage. So we just have the word playing all the time. And I tell people when I do lead them in prayer ministry that if you don't have one, there's great apps on your phone that are free that do an audio reading of the Bible. And all you have to do is turn that on and just keep playing the word with you. you have one earphone in all the time and you're going to mess up anything the devil's trying to tell you. So that would be my immediate um, response to if your thoughts are messed up and you want to correct them just keep the Bible playing in your ear and playing in your home clean the air next lying and exaggeration Leviticus 19:16 tells us do not go about spreading slander among your people Proverbs tells us over and over that he who spreads slander is a fool embellishing your conversations is the same as lying to God 
and liars, according to God, will find their place in the lake of fire. And I don't need to prove this point because the Bible is full of support for what happens to liars and those who deceive others. No truth, no Jesus, no heaven. The Bible is very consistent about that. You must walk in truth. If your life is deceptive in any way, I would be scared to death right now. That is a big standard you will be judged by. I would be cleaning that up right now. I don't care what area of your life, if it, there is areas of your life that you would not want God himself sorting, clean it up. Next, gossiping, backbiting, and tail bearing. This is a deadly team that will be judged by God if not repented of. God lists this as equal to murder in the Bible. And this is murder of a person's reputation and name and will bring the same curse to you as you're trying to plant on them. I've seen this plenty of times. Um, I've, I've sadly done this plenty of times. I regret that terribly because what you launch on someone else is gonna get smacked right back on top of you. So if you think that you're causing harm to someone by saying things about them to cause harm to them, it's gonna show up blowing up your camp is where it's gonna show up. You're gonna have all kinds of crazy problems as a result. God sends it right back to you and he says he will. Exodus 20, 16 says, you shall not bear false witness. This commandment is more about gossip than it is about lying. Basically, I was told back in, uh, by one of, I will, I will say one of the pivotal people in my life was Pastor Jimmy Jack from New York. I mean, that man was bold in addressing me in some of my conduct in my early ministry. Didn't even know me. He had no idea how, how big of an impact he had on my life. I've told him this um, multiple times recently because I am a, I, I so admire that he was, willing to speak into some things that God showed him because one of the things he said to me was, shut your mouth. He said, if you need to say something, say, God bless you. That's it. Shut your mouth. And I knew God said that to me. I knew it. And he didn't even know why he said that to me, but he changed my life when he said that to me. And I admire him and give him a lot of uh, credit for the direction my life took immediately after that because I did shut my mouth. This chatty talk is absolute poison. Leave all friends that draw you into this and I will say personally this is a tough one for me because I have to sift friends frequently and now down to a, just a tiny core because when I hang out with people that are just ugh, chatty like that I'm disgusted at how fast I picked that back up. Fast from talking if you have to. You will not be blessed if you do not control your tongue. Proverbs 20, 19 says, a gossip betrays a confidence. Avoid a man who talks too much. Psalm 15, 1 says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man. Job 13, five says, if only you would be altogether silent for that would be wisdom. James 1, says, if anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Luke 6, 45, the good man brings forth good things out of the good stored up in his heart. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, he, his mouth speaks. Next, impatience, resentment, and retaliation. And this will end up in anger and wrath if not dealt with. It will destroy all of your relationships and you cannot be trusted by God with anything that's valuable to him. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. 1 Peter 2, 19-23 says, For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? 
But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. God will have the last word on everything. Impatience is a fullness of pride, the sin that resembles the devil the most, pride. Murmuring, complaining, and discontentment next. This sin has provoked God's wrath on millions of Israelites from the beginning, and it resulted in their death. They did not get to go to the promised land, which is symbolic of heaven. God actually killed them. God has not changed. He's very clear about that. And this will cause death to our spirits. There's no way that you can continue to be murmuring, complaining, and discontented and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not compatible. Nobody respects a person who constantly complains, and God will certainly not tolerate it in his people either. There will be no change, no breakthrough, no blessing, nothing. You will become more and more reprobate every day until there's nothing about you that anyone can even stand being around. All the curses that come out of your mouth with the choice to do this, allow the enemy to bring your own words to pass in your life and destroy your destiny. You did it yourself. I see a lot of things that say nothing can stop the destiny of God in your life. You're not that strong. Well, actually, the truth is your mouth can stop a lot of things. What comes out your mouth will stop your destiny. If God has something amazing for you, many people lose it because of how they speak. Contention, arguing, quarreling. Next. They're full of pride and forbidden by God. Romans 16, 17 says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division, who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. Galatians 5.15 adds, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out. You will be destroyed by each other. Philippians 2.14, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. 2 Titus 2.23 says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. You don't have to defend God's word on Facebook. God is big enough to defend himself. When people want to argue against the truth of God's word, they're arguing with God, not you. You don't have to start a brawl on Facebook over their need to argue with the truth that's God's truth. State the truth and keep moving. There's nothing honorable about children of God that continue to quarrel, even if it's over what God says. And those in the world point to this as one of the main reasons why they want nothing to do with the church and even seeking a relationship with Jesus. It's how Christians behave with each other. Next, touchiness, easily offended, unforgiving, a bitter spirit, and self-pity. This is living in defeat. Defeated, just defeated. Even as believers in Jesus, we're very effective missionaries for the kingdom of darkness when any of these are entrenched in us and we let them sit there. We've given them a chair and we feed them. And what a sad day it will be on Judgment Day when all of our works are exposed for what they are. These all come out of wounds that can and should be healed and God is very eager to heal them. I know I continuously surround these women with resources to get healing because this is a very prevalent thing in people that come to us. Get healing. We're hurting ourselves when we allow them to stay. We will become hard, critical, and soon our conscience won't even bother us. We are dead spiritually when this stuff roots and is allowed to govern our lives. God says he won't forgive us if we choose to walk in unforgiveness towards others. So there's another problem. You won't be forgiven, which is directly opposed to salvation. 
wounded pride and hurt feelings show that we are not dead to ourselves, that our flesh man is being kept alive and well, which also contradicts being a follower of Jesus Christ. Next, right priorities. How many minutes a day does Jesus get? He doesn't have a savior option only, which people seem to think. Jesus was my Savior, but not my Lord. There is no such thing. The Bible, there is nothing to support that. He only operates in us when he is allowed lordship of our life. There is nowhere where Jesus is Savior and we are allowed to be Lord. Nowhere. What occupies your thoughts? Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I had someone contact me today wanting to question about a relationship, and I said, do you think more about them and pleasing them and seeing them than you do about pleasing Jesus, seeing Jesus, obeying Jesus? That will answer your question. I don't even need to answer your question, whether you should be with them or not. That will answer your question. A person can claim to be a Christian, but if you eavesdrop them on them for even 10 minutes, you can tell where their heart is. They will reveal their heart by just, you can listen to them talk. How do you spend your free time when no one's watching? How do you, what do you watch on TV? Um, do you watch more TV than you spend in God's word? No word equals no change. Is your family your highest priority next to God? So basically, if we don't obey God in the things that he demands, nothing else we do for God is going to matter. Most of us who worked in um, faith-based ministries see the wreckage of the children of many pastors because they forsook their family to be a better pastor and the kids and the wife are left just ravaged and damaged and that's going to be answered for because that's not the right order that's not at all what god asked them to do next honor the sabbath this is completely lost in today this day is not about us and what we want to do this day was meant for the lord and we are to spend this day resting in him our unchanging God issued this decree in Exodus 31, 14. Observe the Sabbath because it's holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. That's how serious he was. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. Leviticus 26, 2 adds, Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Exodus 20, 13 says, Yet the people of Israel rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees, but rejected my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them, and they utterly desecrated my Sabbath. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the desert. Isaiah 58, 13, If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idly, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Basically, you don't hear anything about that anymore. Back when I was younger, you couldn't even find stores open on the Sabbath. It was very rare. And, yeah, I mean, even in my lifetime, you, the culture basically honored that. I mean, it was it was very known that the Sabbath was holy. Even in non-Christian families, they knew. Saturday, Sunday was a day, and I'm not going to argue over which day, but the, the Lord has called for one day to be a day of rest and, and focus on Him. And, and for some reason, our society has gained speed up to 80,000 miles an hour a day, and they've left that completely abandoned. God has not changed. Next, victim mentality. Victim means a living being sacrificed to a supreme being. The person you are a victim to is the true Lord of your life. Jesus is not. What you think in this area is what you act out. It comes out your mouth also. You speak about them pretty constantly and you show indeed that they are the person that is governing your life, governing your thoughts, governing your future. And you must bring your thoughts captive to God who God says you are, not who this person has somehow gotten you to believe that you are, which is a victim to them. Their damage to you somehow has become your identity to you. They don't declare your value, God does. 
Jesus died not just to pay for our sins, but to set us free and break all of these curses from our life. And we need to walk in all that he did, not just the salvation part on the cross. Next, an unwillingness to submit to spouse, church, or delegated authority. And this means in the heart, not just in behavior. Because many people appear to submit in action, but their heart is not submitting at all. And God is actually watching the heart. So it doesn't matter if you're saying that you submit, if you're not really in your mind submitting because God's the judge. And this means, as an example, um, I steer very clear from women who complain about their spouse to their friends. I do not have friends like that. I would never complain about my spouse to anyone because, first of all, he's so honorable that I would not do that. But even if he wasn't, there is absolutely nothing to admire about someone who trashes their spouse in front of other people. That's sin, straight up sin. Never choose stubbornness towards God or people. Rid yourself quickly of all friendships or associations that allow you to speak against others that don't hold you accountable. They're not your friends. They only allow you to further curse your own life and relationships. And again, I regret my own guilt in this area. It does happen and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Many marriages, church memberships and jobs have been lost over the influence of discontented, bitter friends spreading poison. Don't keep them. Next, a desire for fame and vanity. This is self-obsession. It resembles Satan to a, just to a perfect core. We want to be noticed. We want to be significant to someone, many times anyone. We'll do all sorts of things to get attention. And we will answer for this behavior in, first of all, losing favor with God and others. Nobody likes to be around this. We will be held accountable for dressing to entice attention from the opposite sex, same sex, just for dressing to entice attention. I was told early in ministry, dress the way you want your husband's secretary to dress. Best advice I ever got. Lack of commitment is next. We must have the courage and perseverance to pledge ourselves to God forever, marriage forever, family forever, your accountability to others forever, your goals, your purpose to God, stop church hopping, call hopping. God does not change your vision, purpose, and church family over and over and over. The problem is you get offended. Don't allow offense into your spirit because when you can't set and just stay set, you can't, nothing of value is going to come your way from God. Always choose the high road when you're hurting and wanting to run. Take courage and walk in grace. You're going to be greatly rewarded for doing so. Next, avoid procrastination. And this means to put off intentionally something you could do right now that you know you need to do. Again, God can't do much with you when you walk in procrastination. Many people are just stuck with that option. They give themselves the right to procrastinate. I guarantee you when I was like that, nothing happened, nothing changed, nothing moved, I got nowhere. Now I'm almost obsessively the opposite because of how much happens in my life from God, how many opportunities I get because I respond quickly. I guess how many calls I get as a result of that because I do respond quickly. Do things right away that, are, that you know you need to do so that when you do have time to rest, you can rest. Your head isn't constantly nagging, I should have done that, I should do this, I should do this. I make lists on post-it notes all day and I power through them. I get a lot done. I run circles around most people because I, am, I drive my time and then I rest when I need to. Pick up things, put things back where they belong, keep things neat and orderly. I remember hearing Joyce Meyer speak years ago where she said, if you're one of those people that goes into the grocery store and you pick this thing up and then you're gonna buy it and then you decide four aisles later, nah, I want this instead, I'm gonna get this and then you set that thing where that was, God sees that. He also sees that as a character problem. Go put it back where you got it. Put it back. That's what a person with good character would do. 
Next, loneliness. There is a cure for loneliness that's very fast. Be a friend to the lonely. You will never suffer from loneliness again. Don't trust or look for empty activities to fill your time. Look for ways to bless others. You don't need another group. You don't need another. Look for other lonely people. Um, go to um, a nursing home and offer to read to them, offer to color with them. Go to where the lonely are. You will never be lonely again. Come here, hang out with these ladies. They're amazing, crazy fun to hang out with. Look for ways to bless. In turn, God is gonna fill your life with the richest people you ever met. We get a lot of people that wanna um, approach in on us. They think they're gonna bring us amazing. We were just talking about that, that they've got some amazing ministry to bring into us. But I think the most amazing people I know are already here. They're in here. They're incredible. When we listen to each other, there's nothing better. Next, tithing. No, this isn't talked about much either. God owns everything. He owns everything we have. Everything you own, your big pay increase, that big salary, God owns that. To give a tenth is the least you can do for his kingdom. And there should be no argument at all in our spirits or we really need to examine who our master is because there's a much greater issue at stake here. If you feel all of that is yours somehow, your God is yourself slash greed. Money is your God. And greed is extremely offensive to God. And the practice of tithing breaks the power of greed in your life very fast. Not tithing places you under a curse. The money isn't gonna go to heaven with you. In fact, pure gold is pavement in heaven. So money here is something that's gonna burn up in the end. You will get no reward for it. Use it to build the kingdom. That's where your reward will come. If God has honored you with money, bless him back with it because there's no honor in keeping it with him. Next, honor your father and mother. Ephesians 6, 2 through 3 says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. This does not say only if they honored you and didn't abuse you. This is a straight commandment. And it doesn't mean you sin with them. It means you respect them as your parents no matter what. And God will reward you in the relationships with your own children if you honor that commandment and in other ways. Many... Um, who really came from difficult parents. It just means walk in forgiveness. Don't speak evil of them because you have an opportunity to, which that often presents itself, but just don't do it. That's a huge area that God had to deal with me on also. And blaming others for all of your fallen nature, you can't heal what you attribute as the fault of someone else until you take ownership of how you have chosen to act as a result of the abuse or the choices that others have made that have really crippled your life until you own your response and your reaction to those you're not going to heal you can't heal what someone else did you can heal what you've chosen to do with it and so at some point you're going to have to say that terrible thing did happen to me but I am responsible for how I live that out. And I'm gonna give this to God and I'm gonna let him guide this with me. I found this other list that I really liked that I'm just gonna move through quickly. It's from old school. I love old school. They usually, they, have, they had a good handle on a lot of things back then. But it was called Traits of the Carnal Mind. One, a secret sense of price an exalted feeling in view of your success or your position because of your good training and or your appearance, because of your natural gifts and abilities, an important independent spirit, stiffness and preciseness. These are traits of a carnal man, so that's not good. Two, love of human praise, a secret fondness to be noticed, love of supremacy of self, drawing attention to self in conversation, a swelling out of self when you have had a free time of speaking or praying, where you feel self swelling. Three, the stirrings of anger or impatience, but worse of all, you call it nervousness or holy indignation. You explain that anger you feel as holy indignation, a touch 
sensitive spirit, a disposition to resent and retaliate when reproved or contradicted or corrected, sharp, heated flings at another. Four, self-will, a stubborn, unteachable spirit, an arguing, talkative spirit, harsh, sarcastic expressions, an unyielding, headstrong attitude, a driving, commanding spirit, a disposition that loves to be coaxed and humored. Five, carnal fear. This is a man-fearing spirit, shrinking from reproach and duty, reasoning around the cross, a shrinking from your from doing your whole duty by those of wealth or position, a fearlessness that someone will get out of the spirit and thus offend and drive some prominent person away, a compromising, holding back tendency. Uh, there's a lot in there. Six, a jealous disposition, a secret spirit of envy shut up in your heart, an unpleasant sensation in view of the great prosperity or success of another, a disposition to speak of the faults and failings rather than the gifts and virtues of those more talented and appreciated than yourself. Seven, lustful stirrings, unholy actions, a carnal learning, undue affection and familiarity toward those of the opposite sex or same sex, wandering eyes, something in you that you could not be trusted if sufficient opportunity presented itself. Eight, a dishonest, deceitful disposition, evading and covering the truth, covering up your real faults, leaving a better impression of yourself than is actually true, false humility, exaggeration, and straining the truth. Nine, unbelief. A spirit of discouragement in times of pressure and opposition, a lack of quietness and confidence in God, a lack of faith and trust in God, a disposition to worry and complain in the midst of pain and poverty, or at the dispensation of divine providence, an over-anxious feeling whether everything will come out all right. 10. Formality and deadness. This is a lack of concern for lost souls, dryness and indifference, a lack of power with God, selfishness, love of ease, love of money. 11. Stinginess, being over exacting about trifles, falling out with others over small amounts, giving just enough to ease my conscience and less than a poor laborer does for the furtherance of the gospel at home or abroad, big meals went away from home but cheap ones went with wife or children who seldom get out. 12. Sectarianism being narrow and bigoted in favor of my little crowd, cool and unlovely toward others who differ with me, ready to argue and take the contrary side of studiously avoiding those things that might break sweet fellowship, pulling to get members even though I steal them from another congregation, sitting back with a critical and overwise air and failing to cooperate with others for the salvation of souls. So that's the end of my list for this. Daily, I was told often when I um, worked out in the recovery community, which is a very large community, and it, it basically those who have put themselves out in the recovery community by going to treatment, um, identifying with that group, I, I applaud them. I applaud them because there's so many that sit in secret addicted to secret sins, compulsively addicted, who would never expose themselves. But for those who dare to identify as, I've got this problem, I'm putting it on blast, and I'm gonna make myself accountable. I'm, I love being part of that group. But I'm told by this group often that the witness of someone or several someones that claim to be a Christian has caused them to avoid going to church, to avoid being around Christians because they just were so hurt by them. We know that that excuse is not going to uphold on Judgment Day if they abandon God altogether for doing that. But for the most part, don't ever allow yourself to be one of those people that others point to as, because of how they treat me, I don't want anything to do with the religion that they profess. Don't, don't let that be you. 
because God's going to deal with that. He's going to make you answer for that. You're going to get to see what that damage has done when we somehow think we are better than someone else. The only thing God sees that covers our sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. There is not not there is no one that has any ability to look down on someone else. We need to stop sinning. Always make the best choice and never do less than your best. Analyze every single choice you make. What would Jesus do, literally? Never do something you think you may regret. I trust you, you will regret it. Don't do it. If in doubt, don't do it. Acts 20, 24 says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's my life verse. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. One thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So I challenge you and myself to repent of any of these areas. Keep a close watch on them. Find accountability. We need to fall on our faces before Jesus and ask for mercy to overcome. We need to be the bright lights that he's asking us to be in this dark world around us because it's getting very dark very fast. And if we can get these things right, we are going to be blazing, blazing, blazing fires for him because this world is dark and needs to see Jesus. And life will be all that it can be if we choose to do that. So we're building a group because it's better to do in a group than it is to try to do by yourself. If you're a female, we'd love to have you come and hang out with us. We we love to add women to our group. We need to be the reason that people of the world crave to know who our God is. He's awesome. We need to make people, we need to be the salt that people crave to know who is their God. We need to be the Bible in action because many are not reading it. Walking with Jesus is going to cost you everything in the world, but not walking with Jesus is going to cost you everything in eternity and possibly everything in this world too. So choose Jesus. Precious Lord, I pray that, I pray that you help us. I pray that you help us to decide there is not one thing worth making Jesus look not worth it to anyone else that we meet. I ask that you bring conviction to all of us and that you help us all to quickly lay down and get healing and give Jesus his rightful place in every area of our life, that we will quickly build the army and bring the revival that many need to see in our area and in our world. Let it be us, God. Forgive us for all of our sin and help us to be exactly what you want us to be. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.